Camille Abbey. In this series, I'm going to explore the vibrant culture of the Tuscan countryside. Together, we'll visit some of the artisans, chefs, and farm holiday inns the Italians call agriturismo that all contribute to making Tuscany such an enchanting region. In this episode, we'll explore the area around the small town of Rufina, 20 miles northeast of Florence. The castle of Nipozzano has stood here above the Rufina Valley for 800 years. In the Middle Ages, castles like these were built by feudal lords to consolidate power and protect themselves from marauding armies and rivals. Inside the walls, the castles were self-sufficient villages that had a symbiotic relationship with the people who lived in the surrounding countryside. Due to its strategic location, Nipozzano was one of the most important castles in the area. The current owners produce a highly regarded wine from these vineyards, and the once formidable walls now serve as backdrops for portraits of brides and grooms. Across the valley, on the southern slopes of Monte Giovi, I spent a couple of days exploring the agriturismo of Colonialae. Mario Coda Nunziante is the son of the owner and manages the estate. I asked him to describe agriturismo at Colonialae. Where you uh, rent to tourists coming from all over the world, a lot of American people, German people, British people, that they come here in the countryside living uh, as we do, living in the old uh, houses that for sure now have a lot of facilities that before they didn't have. As Mario pointed out, the farmhouses are nice, but what makes Colonialae extra special is its location. If you enjoy walking or hiking, staying at Colonialae is ideal. The whole estate is surrounded by chestnut forest with little country roads and well-maintained trails winding throughout them. I set off one early April afternoon to walk to the top of Monte Giovi. At the peak, 3,000 feet up, signs of spring had not even begun to appear. From Colonialae, guests can also go down to the river Sieve, where trout are a favorite catch for local fishermen. Others prefer the company that gathers at a well-stocked pond. Colonialae maintains many old traditions, and one of the most fascinating is the annual blessing of the fields, or rogazione. Contessa Gabriella Spalletti, Mario's mother, explains. <laughs> rogazioni, rogazioni, uh, to, uh, from uh, Latin rogare, that is uh, chiedere, is uh, asking, rogare. And so the rogazioni, because we ask to give benediction to our work, you see. So it's so very important too. And then, then they give uh, what he wants. <laughs> The ceremony begins with a procession through the estate, led by the Contessa's oldest son, Cesare, and a priest accompanied by several Benedictine monks. The once commonly held ceremony is now so seldom performed that these ultra-traditional monks from France are some of the few who still know the rites. The ceremony culminates with the priest blessing the fields with the holy water that carries the owner's wishes for a bountiful harvest. The 
blessing of the fields at Colonialay comes at a time when spring wildflowers and grasses bloom across the hillsides. Most spectacular of all are the red poppies that seem to explode from every field in Tuscany. Spring is also the most important time for agriculture. The fields need to be prepared and planted, and the trees must be pruned. Obviously, some of the work is done by machine. Though this being Italy, even the tractors are Lamborghinis. Most of the jobs, though, are still done by hand. On a brisk spring morning, <laughs> Colonialay's agricultural <laughs> manager, Marco, showed me how they trim olive trees. The trees have to be pruned at least once every three years so that their energy is put into making olives and not growing branches. They're kept short and open so that the sun can penetrate the leaves. After a quick lesson, I cut some of my own branches, but I felt more qualified helping feed the fire instead. All of the smaller olive branches are burned on the spot, and at this time of year in Tuscany, you can almost always see and smell the smoke. Although I was initially a little bothered by all the burning, I came to understand that these small fires are really the most practical way of disposing of all the cuttings. And I do have to admit that it's pretty fun. I came back to Colonialay another day to meet a couple who are a vestige of Tuscany's ancient agricultural tradition. Alfredo, 82, and Yolanda, 78, live on the estate in an old farmhouse where Alfredo's father grew up. The couple tends a small plot of grapevines and olive trees. They don't pay any rent, but instead give half of their harvest to the owners of Colonialay. This sharecropping system, called Mezzadria, had been the norm for over a thousand years in Tuscany, but is now almost non-existent. The day I spent with them, they were also trimming olive trees. Alfredo's fearless technique made his wife and me nervous. They speak in a dialect which is difficult even for Italians to understand. And my Italian, being rudimentary, it was only later that I understood the full nature of our conversation that day. I was amazed at how hard Alfredo and Yolanda both worked, especially given their ages. They seemed to glow, perhaps the result of a life of outdoor labor, but I suspect it was because they were still very much in love. <laughs> In the spring, you will often see people, mostly women, picking various types of wild greens in the fields and along the side of the road. Some are known for more than their flavor. At the Osteria La Casalina, the seasonal greens present other opportunities. 
Chef owner Stefano Presanetti shows us some he's just picked outside the kitchen door. Wild spinach. The wild spinach is, is uh, just one week. And uh, it's uh, two or two, three weeks in this dish, no more. Now some garlic. Just water and garlic? Just water and garlic. Then I put salt. I have ricotta cheese. So then into the ice bath. Huh. Yes, what they call it. What's the no. name of the, the dish, the whole, the finished? Nudi. 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 Naked ravioli. Yes, you can, it's the same <laughs> of ravioli. And some eggs to hold it together. Yes, one. A little Parmesan. A light dusting of flour and into the hot water for just a couple of minutes. We make a very simple sauce for this. Mmm, truffle oil, our favorite. Stefano shaves aged pecorino onto the nudi and drizzles them with warm truffle oil. It's very simple, very healthy dish. Mm. I mean, I felt like I love cooking in a bunch It's really good. For another sauce, he melts butter and adds fresh grated lemon rind. Yeah, we call it in this also malfatti. That in Italian we say. I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. Stefano's sous chef, Riccardo Massi, demonstrates how to make the traditional Tuscan antipasto, crostini di fegatini, or chicken liver pate. He starts with carrots, red onions, and celery, and then adds capers, chicken livers, anchovies, salt, and finally the sweet Tuscan dessert wine, Vinsanto. After cooking for a while, it's pureed and served on bread. Tuscan food isn't usually as precious as the nudie with wild greens and truffle oil. This Flintstone-sized steak, called a Fiorentina, is much more typical. This one weighs in at about two and a half pounds. It's showered with sea salt, seared on the outside, and served very rare. Once finished, it's ready. No. Dead on the bone. Ah, I didn't know that. Really? Hot bone. Yeah. Hot with meat. This steak is lunch for one. <laughs> Leaving La Casalina, I went down into the center of Rufina. There, I met Sandra Ferroni an artist who paints ceramics in the classic Maiolica styles, typical of Italy's different regions and eras. Sandra replicates drawings from books onto plates, bowls, and decorative objects. Sandra also makes her own clay forms. She then traces the original drawing. Ah. She then rubs charcoal through the holes onto the plate, giving her the rough outlines of the design, which serves as a guide for her painting. The charcoal burns away when the piece is eventually fired. Sandra's elegant pieces grace many of Rufina's finest villas, and on the slopes of a nearby hillside, I visited one that is now a beautiful agriturismo. Wow, 
Behind me is the Villa Busini, built in the early 15th century by a member of Florentine aristocracy. The villa was later bought by the Medici's and, in 1930, was sold to its current owners, the Nicolodi family. Both the house and the gardens are noted in the National Historic Landmark Registry, and the gardens are protected to such a point that no plant in them can be changed from the original Renaissance design. This can be a challenge for the owners, who can't plant anything that wasn't there already. The reward for the guest, however, is an authentic Renaissance garden. Inside, Villa Busini is cozy and filled with antiques and art. In the center of the house is the remnant of a 12th century tower, around which the rest of the villa was built. With its exposed stone and fragments of ancient columns, the room retains some of its medieval atmosphere. The guest rooms are very simple, but are bright and have quaint features like these stone wash basins. I came back one night to cook some rustic dishes with Signora Nicolodi. So here we're cooking. I'm, I'm cooking a small amount. I will prepare for you uh, just a little uh, fettuccine with ragu and just a little spaghetti with a matriciana. <laughs> so you can try everything. Okay? We made some basic pasta sauces and pork cooked in milk. Mm -hmm. So it's ready for add milk. Okay. <laughs> I had a little time before dinner was served, so I entertained myself and practiced my atrocious <laughs> Italian. Next morning, I visited the sheep farm called Licciolo, one of Rufina's only cheese producers. Enrico Di Marino is the owner and only full-time worker, so he puts in a long day, feeding and milking the sheep in the early morning and again at night. In between, he makes his delicious pecorino cheese. All the babies right here are still waiting because they don't get fed. Right now we've just got all the milk and we're going to find out what to do with it. This is yesterday's milk and then later he'll get the other milk from today. The basic process of cheese making is the same everywhere. Rennet, a natural enzyme from calves, is added to heated fresh whole milk, which begins the process of separating the curds, which make up the cheese, from the whey, the byproduct. It seems to be a very time sensitive operation. It's turning very quickly from a yogurt substance to something more like cottage cheese and now into real cheese. Enrico's tiny production ensures a real handmade product. Nobody else touches the cheese but him. We're having a little, little wine with our cheese this morning at about 10. Mm. Enrico's cheeses are exceptional. When the sheep were let out for their daily romp, I followed. You can hear the sound of the dog barking. That's the five very, very astute sheep dogs here watching the sheep. We tried to sneak up on them, but they saw us come and smelled us, heard us, I don't know. And so they proceeded to sit here and bark at us for the past five minutes. I went to 
few miles down the river Sieve to the town of Ponte Sieve. Of course, the Italian mercato has fantastic produce, but on this day, I found something a little different. Giacomo Bernini actually works this fast for three straight hours. And yes, the cheese is as good as the show. Nestled in the hills above Ponte Sieve, I found the agriturismo called Casabella. The estate produces organic wine and olive oil and provides elegant accommodations for visitors, either in the main villa or in the restored farmhouses. Guests are invited to dine family style in the private dining room where classic Tuscan dinners are served every night. The guest rooms are simple and authentic and have beautiful views of the surrounding vineyards and olive groves. Co-owner and manager Fay Latero showed us around, and our first stop was the ceramic studio that is located on the estate. So we're here in Pianigiani, it's the house of Mr. Nocenti, and that's where on the ground floor he has his own atelier, his lab, where he makes his ceramics. Innocenti's two sons prepare the clay forms by hand. He sketches the original designs, and his wife, another son, and daughter-in-law paint them. His work reflects influences from his many travels, and the pieces are sold throughout Italy and abroad. Maestro Innocenti also offers classes in ceramic painting to Casabella's guests. Across the estate, Faye showed us another of Casabella's treasures. So this is a 15th century windmill. It's been renovated by the School of Architecture of Florence with the School of Dusseldorf of Germany and professors from Holland. Here, one of Faye's partners is practicing putting up the canvas sails, which takes about two hours. Faye told us that the windmill has been restored for its original use of grinding grain and is one of only four in all of central and northern Italy and the only one that has been renovated. The next day we headed to Valabuana, the equestrian center on the estate. Here, people with a passion for riding can have a real horse holiday. They spend their time on trail rides, in the ring, and feeding and grooming the horses. I talked with Franco Meliz, who runs Valabuana, and learned a bit about what guests here can expect. People are coming here and uh, they could have experience or uh, they could have no experience at all. Oh. It's not, uh, you know, a place where you go for riding uh, and uh, groups, for one hour, uh, and, for then one hour and, then, and then you forget. No, no, it's not that, it's not that. In fact, most riders come in groups and they stay together in the rooms at Balabuana, spending their days riding and sharing meals together. Franco also accommodates guests who are not in the full immersion plan, and he kindly took me on a trail ride. Afterwards, I went back to the cozy Valabona farmhouse, where I soothed my aches and pains by the fire. And Casabella has even more to offer. Guests can also take guided wine tastings, cooking classes, and tours of the traditional olive mill. Even though there's so much to do here, it's a perfect place to just relax. Casabella, like many of the best agriturismos throughout the region, provides the visitor the opportunity to really experience and embrace the vibrant culture of Tuscany.